Hello everyone. So in the last lecture, we had continued discussing the social security legislations which form a part of the social security code. So there are a total of nine legislations. We have discussed seven of them. Now we are left with the two major legislations in the social security code. The one is the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 1952. And the other one is the ESIC Act of 1948. So friends, these are the two major legislations, the EPFO and ESIC. They both are statutory bodies formed under these two acts respectively. So therefore, these need to be covered in detail because questions have been asked about EPFO and ESIC. And since the exam itself is for a post in EPFO, rather two posts in EPFO, so you have to have a fair idea about EPFO and ESIC so that you, you get the basic idea about the social security uh, infrastructure that the central government or the these two central legislations they provide to the people of India. So let us start with the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 1952. So friends, now onwards, because it's a very big name to pronounce the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1952, we shall call it EPF Act here onwards for this lecture. Well, the most important part is to whom does this act apply? Like in every legislation we have seen, there is this section one called short title extent and application so yes it extends to all of india now including j and k and for your knowledge i would rather like to add here that the j and k had a separate state employees provident fund organization gradually which is being merged into the employees provident fund the epfo under the ministry of labor and employment so the work of merger is ongoing and it is about to get completed in some time now so let us see to which establishments does this act apply. So it applies to every establishment which is a factory engaged in any industry specified in schedule one and in which 20 or more persons are employed. So there are two catches here. One is it should be listed in schedule one and don't get confused by the schedules that schedule one contains an exhaustive list of the class of establishments which shall be covered under the EPF and MP Act. Now, so most of the establishments, rather most of the types of establishments are already somehow or the other covered under the schedule one. Therefore, you name an establishment, more chances than not are that it shall be there in the schedule one. Therefore, most of the private establishments are covered under EPFO because they somehow fall under one or the other head in the schedule one. And what about the 20 or more persons? The moment the establishment crosses the strength of 19 that is a minimum of 20 persons are employed the epf and mp act starts becoming applicable right so and like in all the other legislations we have discussed even if the employee strength comes below 20 right so suppose at one point of time due to surge in demand there were 20 or 21 employees in the establishment the start the act starts becoming applicable and after drop in demand after three months the company retrenches 10 employees only 10 or 11 employees are remaining in that establishment so in that case also the epf and mp act shall continue to be applicable right and it shall also be applicable to any other establishment which employs 20 or more person or class of such establishments which the central government may by notification in the official gazette specify in this behalf. Rather, so it's very clear that the central government has very broad powers and not just the establishments covered under schedule one, but any other establishments which employs 20 or more persons can be designated by the central government to come under EPF and MP Act just by notification in the official gazette. However, there is another added caveat to it that the central government may after giving not less than two months notice of its intention so to do by notification in official gazette apply the provisions 
to any such number of person less than 20 as may be specified in the notification right so if the establishment if the central government gives a two months notice even this bar of 20 employees can be crossed that it can make the act applicable to establishments in which there are not even 20 employees to less than 20 as well therefore we can see that central government has wide ranging powers further in spite of anything contained in subsection 3 where it appears to central provident fund commissioner and we shall call central provident fund commissioner as cpfc here onwards for saving time so whether on application made to him in this behalf of or otherwise that the employer and the majority of employees in relation to an establishment have agreed that the provisions of this act should be made applicable to the establishment he may by notification in the official gazette apply the provisions of this act to the establishment right so it's about the voluntary coverage mind you so if the majority of employees employer and the majority of employees check these words if these together they are in agreement that they, they should voluntarily go for coverage so even if the total strength is below 20 or whatever the strength is still an application can be made to the central provident fund commissioner for voluntary coverage under epf and mp act right so what is the next point Establishment to which act applies shall continue to be governed by this act in spite, notwithstanding means in spite that the number of persons employed therein at any time falls below 20. This we I have just told you, like in all the other legislations, there is a provision here as well that even if the establishment strength goes below 20, the act continues to be applicable. So there are some key terminologies which you have to understand in accordance with EPF and MP Act. The basic wages. It means all emoluments which are earned by the employee while, while on duty or on leave or on holidays with wages in either case in accordance with the terms of the contract of employment and which are paid or payable in cash to him but does not include. It means that basic wage means all em emoluments which does not include the cash value of any food concession any dearness allowance that is to say all cash payments by whatever name called paid to an employee on account of a rise in cost of living house rent allowance overtime allowance bonus commission or any other similar allowance payable to the employee in respect of his employment or of work done in such employment any presents made by the employer so basic wages in itself is a is a basic term you can say that it is the basic amount of salary which is considered to be the somehow which is relatable to the designation or the hierarchy with which the employee works so as we have said that uh, seen that in government sector or as well there is a concept of basic pay and all other emoluments etc are calculated as a certain percentage of that basic wage similarly for private sector as well the epf act describes the basic wages at all emoluments except the cash value of food concession any allowances like dearness allowance house rent allowance overtime allowance bonus commission or etc because all these are calculated at certain percentage of the basic wage only any presents made by the employer shall also not be part of basic wage and the other definitions that is the employer etc means they are the similar to most of the other legislations that we have seen till now so what is the meaning of employee because an employee has a very broad meaning in EPF and MP Act. Therefore, it's necessary to understand the definition of employee. So, employee is employed by or through a contractor in or in connection with the work of an establishment. Right. So, first let us start from here. The employee means any person who is employed for wages in any kind of work, manual or otherwise in or in connection with the work of the establishment right so any kind of work the establishment is doing 
which is directly for the work of the establishment or maybe in connection with the work of the establishment and who gets his wages directly or indirectly from the employer right so even if the wages are not paid directly by the employer does not mean that the person shall cease to be the employee he still continues to be an employee if he is receiving wages indirectly it includes any person who is employed by or through a contractor in or in connection with the work of the establishment right so if it if the employee is employed through a contractor this means that all the contractual employees they are also considered to be the employee of the establishment for epf act further all employees engaged as an apprentice not being an apprentice engaged under the apprentices act 1961 right so if there is an apprentice only engaged under the apprentice act of 1961 then only the employee is not considered to be employee under for the purpose of epf act otherwise all the employees who are interns or apprentices otherwise they are also considered to be employee right so so the definition of employee therefore is quite broad when it comes to epf and mp act right and what is exempted employee the one who has been granted exemption under section 17 right so this we shall see when we go forward what is section 17 and how the an, an employee becomes an exempted employee what is the meaning of exempted establishment the exempted establishment means an establishment who has been granted exemption under section section 17 from operation of all or any provisions of the scheme of any scheme or the insurance scheme right so the thing is there can be a case where one scheme is applicable to an establishment and it has been granted exemption from the other scheme or the ins insurance scheme whatever the case may be so the exemption can be overall as well as very particular as well so what does the word superannuation mean the superannuation in relation to an employee who is member of the pension scheme means the attainment by the said employee of the age of 58 years right so what is the age of age of superannuation or retirement for the purposes of epf act that is 58 years what is the significance of this age that after the age of 58 years the employee considered to be retired for the purposes of epf and mp act and becomes eligible for the pension through the pension scheme however who is eligible to get pension only those employees who have rendered a minimum compulsory service of 10 years right only those employees after attaining the age of 58 years are eligible for pension under epf act well establishment to include all departments and branches so there you can imagine that suppose if there there are 10 employees in a company it opens a branch and the branch consists of some 15 employees so how will that be treated by the epf and mp act will that those be two separate establishments and no coverage will be ensured or will they be considered as one establishment and coverage will be ensured in that case it is therefore it is hereby declared that when an establishment consists of different departments or has branches whether situated in the same place or in different places all such departments or branches shall be treated as parts of the same establishment therefore this removes the ambiguity that even if multiple branches are opened of an establishment and none of the establishments have reached the threshold of 20 employees even then the total of the employees shall be calculated in all these branches and departments and then the total or final strength of the establishment shall be decided for coverage of epf and mp act and if the total strength goes to be beyond 20 or 20 the coverage of epf and mp act shall be ensured so there are provident fund schemes which are formulated under the epf and mp act so the most important scheme is the employees provident fund scheme 
right and the fund there is a shall be a fund as well the employees provident fund and the fund shall vest in and administered by the central board constituted in the section 5a we will see what the central board is and the details of central board of trustees however suffice it to say here that the employees provident fund scheme is the most significant scheme of social security in india right now that the scheme is formed under section 5 of epf and mp act and it is applicable to all those establishments to whom the act applies now we have reached to section 5 that is central board the central government may by notification of official gazette constitute a board of trustees for the territories to which this act extends consisting of following persons right so this is the central board or the central board of trustees which we can call it so what is the which all are the constituents a chairman and a vice chairman to be appointed by the central government so generally who is the chairman right now the chairman is the minister of labor and employment in the central government is the chairman of the central board currently the central provident fund commissioner ex officio is a member of central board not more than 5 persons appointed by the central government from amongst its officials right so five persons are appointed by the central government from amongst its officials not more than 15 persons representing governments of such states as the central government may specify in this behalf appointed by the central government so you can see that all the appointments are being made by the central government only so even if the 15 persons they are representing governments of such states only those states which the central government has specified and the person shall be appointed by the central government only further 10 persons representing employers of the establishment to which the scheme applies right so from the employers associations employer bodies etc 10 persons shall be there to represent those employers and they shall be appointed after consultation with such organizations of employer as may be recognized by the central government in this behalf right so for the 10 persons which represent employees in the establishments shall also be there in the central board of trustees so central board of trustees is a very powerful body when it comes to epf act because it manages the fund it runs the whole epfo and the head of the epfo who is the central pf commissioner or the central provident fund commissioner is the ex officio secretary of the central board of trustees and the cpfc helps the central board of trustee in running the epf and mp act or running the epfo at large the accounts of the central board shall be audited annually by the comptroller and auditor general of india you all must be aware that this is also called as cag it is a constitutional body and any expenditure incurred by him in connection with such audit shall be payable by the central board to the cag of india right the central board shall get its accounts its books audited by the cag and the expenses shall also be paid by the central board to the cag what about the executive committee well the central government may by notification in the official gazette execute an executive committee because the central board of trustees is a large body it cannot meet very frequently it's very it becomes very difficult the executive committee has been formed therefore to assist the central board in its performance of its functions so what shall be the constitution of the executive committee that there shall be a chairman chairman shall be appointed by the central government from amongst the members of the central board and further there shall be two persons appointed by the central government from amongst the persons referred to in clause b of subsection that is two persons who shall be the central officials representing the central government three persons from amongst the persons who are representing the state governments three persons representing the employers three persons representing the employees 
the Central Provident Fund Commissioner ex officio. So they, this shall be a smaller body which can meet more often, right? So that it can help CBT in regular functioning of the organization. Right, the central government may also, after consultation with the government of any state, by notification in the official gazette, constitute for that state a board of trustees. Right, and that shall be referred to a state board in such manner as may be provided for in this scheme. Therefore, a state board can also be constituted, but mind you, it has to be constituted by the central government only, and that shall be after consultation with the government of the state. So, this, the constitution of the state board, etc., shall be notified in the Gazette by the central government only. Appointment of officers. Well, the central government shall appoint a central provident fund commissioner who shall be the CEO of the central board and shall be subject to the general control and superintendence of that board. So, CPFC shall report to that CBT and shall be under the superintendence and control of that board. The central government may also appoint a financial advisor and chief accounts officer to assist the CPFC in discharge of his duties. Further, there is an interesting thing that the central board now employs the other employees. It's not the central government. Mind you, the appointments to the posts like additional central provident fund commissioners, deputy provident fund commissioner, regional provident fund commissioner, assistant provident fund commissioners, and such other officers and employees as, as it may consider necessary for the efficient administration of scheme and the insurance scheme. All those appointments have to be made by the central board and not the central government. Therefore, the current exam, which is for the post of assistant provident fund commissioner, shall the appointment shall also be made by the central board and not the central government mind you no appointment to the post of central provident fund commissioner or an additional central provident fund commissioner or a financial advisor chief accounts officer or any other post in the central government carrying a scale of pay equivalent to the group a or group b under the central government shall be made except after consultation with the upsc that is union of public service commission Therefore, the act itself lays a bar that the central government or the CBT cannot make any appointment up till group B without the consultation with Union Public Service Commission. That is why your two posts, that is one is for enforcement officer and the other one is for assistant provident fund commissioner or APFC. Both are being, the exams for both are being conducted by the Union Public Service Commission itself. It shall Conduct the examination, prepare a merit list, and then give the offer of the offer of appointment. Then be given to those employees only by the EPFO. Further, the state board has also got the powers to appoint such staff as it may consider necessary. So. Central board shall be specifying the method of recruitment, salary allowances, etc. of the all the officers which are mentioned above. And it central board shall be such as may be specified by the in accordance with the. So it has to be done only in accordance with the rules and orders applicable to the officers and employees of the central government drawing corresponding scale of pay. So it cannot be done arbitrarily that it the fixing of salary allowances, etc. It shall be in accordance with the rules of the central government only, which is applicable for other departments, ministries, etc. Further, however, there is a special power to central board that the central board is of the opinion that it is necessary to make a departure from the said rules or orders. It shall obtain the prior approval of the central government. Then only such departure can be done. The next is the Contributions and matters which may be provided for in these schemes. The contribution which shall be paid by the employer or the fund shall be 10%. So it has been raised to 12% now of the basic wages, dearness allowance and retaining allowance for the time being payable to each of the employees, whether employed by them directly or through a contractor and the employee's contribution shall be equal to the contribution payable by the 
employer in respect of him and may if any so desires be an amount exceeding 10% of his basic wages dns funds and relating allowance subject to the condition that the employer shall not be under any obligation to pay any contribution over and above his contribution so let me explain to to you in very simple language because the language is a little tough to understand well the contribution shall be 12% read it as 12% of the basic wages dns allowance and the retaining allowance etc right so so therefore there is a term called pf wage and 12% of that pf wage shall be the contribution of the employer and the employee shall also be contributing the 12% that is an equal amount which the employer is contributing further there is one relaxation to the employer that the employee can contribute more if he wants more than the ceiling of 12% however the employer shall be under no obligation to pay a matching contribution that it's not that if the employee says that he'll pay the whole basic as the contribution to epf the employer shall not be forced to make an equal contribution the liability of the employer shall be restricted towards only the statutory limit of 12% of the basic da and other retaining allowances etc now the next is employees pension scheme so we see, we have seen that under section 5 an epf scheme is being formed now the in, under the section 6 say the employees pension scheme is to be formed by the government it deals with superannuation pension retiring pension permanent total disablement pension to the employees widow or widower's pension children pension or orphan pension payable to the beneficiaries of such employees all kinds of pension are dealt with under the employees pension scheme right so what shall be the percentage of contribution such sums from the employer's contribution under section 6 not exceeding 8 10 one third percent of the basic wages dns allowance and retaining allowance if any of the concerned employees as may be specified in the pension scheme therefore what shall be the contribution of the to the pension fund it shall be 8.33 percent of the basic wages dns allowance and retaining allowance therefore suppose if the employer is contributing 12 percent in that case 8.33 percent goes to this pension scheme and the remaining 3.67% goes to the PF scheme and the whole 12% of the employee goes to the PF itself. Therefore, the total amount of contribution to the PF becomes 12% of the employer, employee and the 3.67% of the employer that is 15.67% goes to the PF scheme and the remaining 8.33 goes to the pension scheme. So this distribution you should remember, this can be asked. So there shall be a separate fund, the pension fund, right? Well, the central government has been given the power to amend or vary either prospectively or retrospectively the scheme, the pension scheme or the insurance scheme. And in every notification issued under this shall be laid before the House of the Parliament. So, Section 7A, what is it about? It is about determination of monies due from employer that all the above officers, Assistant Provident Fund Commissioner upwards, they can determine the amount of money that is due from an employer. And what shall be the two circumstances? First, in a case where dispute arises regarding the applicability of this act, whether the act is applicable or not, if the establishment says that the act is not applicable on us and the department or the EPFO through its inspectors feels that the act is applicable in that case, the Assistant Provident Fund Commissioner upwards any authority can determine the applicability of the act. Further, if there is money due from the employer and the employer does not agree to it, then the authority shall have the power to determine the amount due from any employer under the provisions of this act.
further under the subsection 4 if the order under subsection 1 is passed against an employer ex parte well if the employer it's given upwards that if the employer does not present himself in the during the inquiry if there is any inquiry under this section section 7a for determination of monies due from the employers and the employer does not appear in the inquiry then the authority has the power to pass an ex parte order ex parte means without the presence of the party that is if one party is not being they are in the proceedings or the inquiry the authority has the the quasi judicial authority has the pa powers to pass an ex parte order however this ex parte order may be challenged within 3 months and the if the sufficient grounds are provided as to why the employee employer could not appear the order can be set aside and there can be a fresh order be passed by the authority the orders passed under section 7a shall be reviewed under section 7b right so the officer can on his own motion review his order if he is satisfied that it is necessary to do on any such ground that if there has been a discovery of new and important matter or evidence after which the exercise of due diligence was not within his knowledge therefore if some new fact circumstance evidence etc has come then there can be the order passed under section 7 above can be reviewed under section 7b further there is a safeguard that no appeal shall lie against the order of the officer so it's upon the officer to review his own order under section 7a under 7b or not so the officer the decision of the officer to not entertain or reject an application for review shall not be liable to appeal well so if an appeal is filed the appeal shall be only against the order under section 7a therefore section 7b gives the discretionary power if the officer thinks he or she can review its his or her own order however if does not then the order under section 7a shall prevail and any challenge shall be made against the order under 7a only further there is another provision that within 5 years from the date of communication of the order passed under section 7a or section 7b the authority can reopen the case and pass appropriate order orders redetermining the amount due from the employer in accordance with the provisions of this act so within 5 years if some other necessary facts etc come to the knowledge then the order can be revised within 5 years and what about the let us go to now tribunals so section 7d provides for tribunals the industrial tribunal considered by uh, constituted by the central government under section 1 of section 7a of the industrial disputes act 1947 shall on and from the commencement we shall read about the industrial disputes act therefore the industrial tribunal cons constituted under subsection 1 of section 7a of ida that is industrial disputes act shall be the tribunal for the purposes of epf and mp act as well well so for preventing multiplicity of tribunals that same tribunal has been given the powers to hear appeals against orders passed under epf and mp act so any person aggrieved under order because of order under subsection 1 of section 7a or 7b can approach the tribunal procedure of the tribunal the tribunal shall have the power to regulate its own procedure in all the matters arising out of the exercise of its powers or of the discharge of its functions including the places at which the tribunal shall have its sittings right so tribunal shall be deemed to be a civil court and the code of criminal procedure shall apply 
further the orders of the tribunal a tribunal may after giving the parties to the appeal an opportunity of being heard pass such orders their own as it thinks fit so what the tribunal can do it it can confirm modify or annul the order which is, has been passed under section 7a or 7 7b by the appropriate quasi judicial authority so the tribunal can confirm modify or annul the order and pass a new order right further the tribute tribunal has also been given the power that any time within 5 years from the date of its order it can rectify any mistake apparent from the record and any order passed under sub section 1 further there has there is again a very important point here that no appeal by the employer shall be entertained by a tribunal unless he has deposited with it 75% of the amount due from him as determined by an officer referred to in section 7a so the employer has to first deposit the 75% of the amount as determined under section 7a then only the tribunal shall accept the appeal provided that the tribunal may for reasons to be recorded in writing waive or reduce the amount to be deposited under this section right so the tribunal has the authority to waive or reduce the amount to be deposited under this section so the interest shall also be payable by the employer that the employer shall be liable to pay simple interest at the rate of 12% per annum or at such higher rate from the date on which the amount has become so due till the date of actual payment so therefore if the establishment has decided to go for appeal etc the interest shall be applicable and till the date of payment the interest shall keep adding to the principal amount so section 8 is about the recovery of monies due from the employers therefore the epfo has the powers as we have seen in other acts that the power to recover monies due from the employers in accordance in accordance with section 7a 7b the damages which are recoverable under section 14b we shall see the section 14b so the all these amounts can be recovered by employees provident fund organization in the manner which has been described here now what shall be the manner of recovery that we will see now first is the amount of under section 8a let us see the recovery of monies by employers and contractors right so any employer can deduct the amount payable to the contractor what can he deduct he can deduct the amount of contribution that is the employer's contribution as well as the employee's contribution in pursuance of any scheme right so he can before making a payment to the contractor the employer has the authority to deduct the epf amount due from the employer right thereby ensuring that the compliance to the provisions of epf and mp act is done 8b is the issue of certificate to the recovery officer well there is an assessing authority and the assessing authority which which has assessed the amount under section 7a or 7b issues a certificate to the recovery officer and this certificate is the ground on which the recovery officer starts recovery proceedings so what are the manners for recovery the attachment and sale of the movable or immovable property of the establishment or as the case may be the employer right so the movable immovable property of both the establishment as well as the employer can be attached arrest of the employer and his detention in prison can also take place in for facilitate facilitation of recovery and a receiver can also be appointed for the management of movable or immovable properties of the establishment or as the case may be of employer therefore all is the responsibility of the 
officer who is recovering that is the recovery officer to ensure that a receiver is appointed and the properties which have been attached are taken care of in accordance with law further there are other modes of recovery like the amount which is due from any person or any employer who is in area as the central provident fund commissioner or any other officer authorized by the board in this behalf may require such person to deduct from the said amount the arrears due from such employer under this act any such person shall comply with any such requisition and shall pay the sum so deducted to the credit of the central provident fund commissioner or the officer so authorized therefore suppose it includes under its purview all the banks and other agencies who are supposed to pay the employer and who have got the custody of the employer's money so if an employee's employer is defaulting and suppose he has to pay 1 lakh rupees to the employees provident fund organization then the bank has to give that money on behalf of employer to the epfo under section 8f and suppose if only 50000s are there in the account in the bank deposits those 50000s shall be given and suppose if 2 lakh is there in the account only 1 lakh that is the amount of recovery pending shall be given under this section well it is now very clearly said that the application of certain provisions of income tax there is there are certificate proceedings rules the same certificate proceedings rules shall be applicable for the recovery proceedings under epf and mp act which are applicable to income tax act well there is another section that no employer in relation to an establishment to which any scheme or applies shall by reason of his liability for the payment of any contribution or any charges reduce whether directly or the wages of employer to him the scheme applies to the total quantum in the nature of old pension gratuity to which the employee is entitled in the terms of his employment express or implied the language is a little complicated i shall try to simplify this for you that the employer cannot just to pay his liability for the payment of contribution to epf act or other such liabilities reduce the wages of the employee that is indirectly it can be said that the employer cannot deduct the employee employer's contribution from the employee salary that it cannot do that suppose out of 10000 1500 is the or 1200 is the employer share and the employer cannot do that it reduces the salary of the employee by a tune of 1200 to ensure that his share is paid this shall be offence under epf and mp act the next is the inspe inspectors the appointment of inspectors shall be done by the central government and the powers etc all provisions pertaining to inspectors as we have seen in certain cases are given under section 13 section 14 deals with the penalties right so whoever gives a false statement shall also be punishable with an imprisonment for the term which may extend to 1 year or with 5000 fine etc so there is a provision of punishment which extends to 1 year fine of 10000 rupees in case of default in payment of employee's contribution which has been deducted by the employer from the employee wages well so there are stringent penalties well there is an one more important section 14 ab that in spite of anything contained in the code of criminal procedure 1890 an offence relating to default in payment of contribution by the employer punishable under this act shall be cognizable well so it's a cognizable offence and what is the meaning of cognizable offence that in that case the investigation the fir can be registered without preliminary investigation right so once such offence is done by an employer the police or the law enforcement mechanisms have to register an fir in that case without the preliminary investigation itself
so under section 14b the damages can be recovered however the employer shall be given a reasonable opportunity of being heard so what is the damages damages is because of delay in payment of the due amount due under epf and mp act there shall be damages accruable to the amount which is due and that damage shall be paid by the employer and the authorities the assistant provident fund commissioner onwards have the authority to levy and recover damages however there shall be a reasonable opportunity of being heard given to the employer in this case now we come to the exemption part that the act not to apply to certain establishments so to any establishment registered under cooperative cooperative societies act or any law for the time being in force in any state relating to cooperative societies employing less than 50 persons and working without the aid of power right so any establishment which is a cooperative society and which has less than 50 persons working without the aid of power this act shall not apply to any other establishment belonging to or under the control of central government or a state government whose employees are entitled to benefit of contributory provident fund or old age pension in accordance with any scheme or rule so if the central government employees or state government employees are working and their contributory provident fund and their social security benefits are already taken care of by the central government or the state government this act shall not apply to such establishments however there is a catch here that these days recently epfo is having a drive to cover all the government offices you, you many of you must have heard about that so why is that if the cent if the act does not apply to such establishments why the central why the state government and central government organizations have to take registration code under epf and mp act that is because most of these central government or state government establishments they have privately employed staff here which are employed on contractual basis and suppose if these staff are there their social security benefits are ensured by the epf only and that can only be done if the concerned central or the state government takes a registration or get itself covered under epf act further it shall also not be applicable so therefore what comes out from this discussion is that if there is no contractual employee in any state government or central government establishment the act is not applicable at all on that establishment or that department that ministry however if there are private or contractual staff which is working in that establishment there are provisions which ensure that these particular departments or bodies or agencies of the government they get themselves covered under epf and mp act further not all it is not applicable to any the establishment set up under any central provincial or state act and whose employees are entitled to the benefits of comp- contributory provident fund or old age pension in accordance with any scheme or rule framed under that act governing such benefits so there are two types of bodies one are directly under the central or state government other are the statutory bodies formed under the central or the provincial acts so those shall also not be eligible to be covered under epfo if the employees are entitled to benefits of cpf or old age pension etc well if the central government is of opinion that having regard to the financial position of any class of establishments or other circumstances of the case it is necessary or expedient to do so it may by notification in the official gazette and subject to such conditions exempt whether prospectively or respros that class of establishments from the operation of this act for such period as may be specified therefore what is coming out from here is that if any class of circumstances uh, class of establishment because of their financial position are you know worthy or they deserve to be exempted then this call has to be taken by the central government and such establishment by a notification can be exempted well certain employers can also be authorized to maintain provident fund accounts 
if 100 and more persons are employed in an establishment and an application is made by the employer to the central government the central government may by an order in writing allow these employers to maintain a provident fund account in relation to the establishment subject to such terms and conditions as may be specified in the scheme further such authorization shall be made only if the employer has not defaulted under any provision of the provident fund act or any contribution so who has the power to exempt the appropriate government may by notification in the official gazette exempt whether prospectively or retrospectively from the operation of all or any provisions of the scheme further the condition is that any establishment to which this act applies and in the opinion of the appropriate government the rules of provident fund with respect to the rates of contribution are not less favorable than those specified in section 6 and the employees are in enjoyment of other provident fund benefits which are on the whole are not less favorable to the employees than benefits provided under this act so it becomes very clear that if an establishment is already giving more benefits or at least not less benefits when it it is compared with epf and mp act then that particular establishment can run its own provident fund that is the establishment can be exempted from the provisions of epf and mp act or one or the other scheme only so what happens is in most of the cases the exemption to the establishment is granted just from the employees provident fund scheme that is only one scheme that is employees provident fund scheme is allowed to be run by the establishment because the pension scheme is an entitlement based scheme in which certain amount of subsidy is also given by the central government so that scheme is not favorable for an establishment to run therefore for example there is a company big company called hcl which has its major offices in gurgaon noida etc so it runs its own provident fund scheme to its employees however the pension contribution goes to the respective regional provident fund commissioner office of epf only further any establishment if the employees of such establishment are in enjoyment of benefits in the nature of provident fund pension or gratuity and the appropriate government is of the opinion that such benefits on the whole are not less favorable to such employees right so it's just that the benefit should not be less favorable as compared to to the epf and mp act further no such exemption shall be granted in respect of a class of persons unless the appropriate government is of the opinion that the majority of persons constituting such class desire to continue or to be entitled to such benefits right so this also shall be ensured that the majority of person they should be of the opinion that the exemption should be granted right so if there are provisions under subsection the employer of an exempted establishment or of an exempted employee of an establishment to which the provisions of pension scheme apply shall in spite of any exemption granted under subsection 1 of subsection 2 pay the pension fund any such proportion of the employer's contribution to its provident fund within such time and in such manner as be so therefore if the employer is exempted from the pension scheme the uh, provident fund scheme then the contribution in the pension scheme has to be deposited by the employer
well the provisions of this act shall have effect notwithstanding anything inconsistent therewith contained in the life insurance corporation act of 1956 in spite of anything inconsistent is found in the lic act the provisions of this act shall have effect even if something inconsistent with lic act is mentioned here so this is a very common provision that no suit proceeding or legal proceedings shall lie against the central government state government presiding officer tribunal or any other referred to in section 7a inspector or any other person for anything which is done in good faith so it's a protection to central government to act according to laws and not and work without fear and favor right so such independence is ensured now we move on to schedule 1 the list of industries so we don't have to see the list in detail but we have to see have a gross idea all kinds of industries are mentioned here before that one thing we have missed is the exempted employee what is an exempted employee so i guess that provision has not come and it has come that only the central government has the powers to exempt an employee through certain ceiling limit of salary and so let us discuss it without specifically seeing the legal provisions for your own knowledge i am i have to explain this that the current statutory ceiling limit for coverage of employees is 15000 rupees right so if an employee is earning to the ceiling of 15000 and joins a new establishment he or she shall definitely be a member of epf and mpa so the pf salary if it is below the threshold of 15000 the employee is definitely going to be made a member of epf if he or she is a new employee what about the old employees suppose an employee is getting 14000 now and joins an establishment becomes a member of epf and mp act so suppose the same employee leaves this current establishment that is a and joins an establishment called b where his or her salary becomes 20000 so what shall be in that case will the employee continue to be member of epf and mp act yes the answer is yes even if the pf salary increases to 20000 in a new establishment the employee shall continue to be member of epf act if once he or she has become a member of epf act right so the membership shall continue even if the employee's salary keeps on increasing and might reach lakh therefore and the second question arises is what shall be the contribution to the employees provident fund employees provident fund scheme employees pension scheme etc will it be more in proportion to the salary or will it be the same up to the ceiling of 15000 only so the answer is a mix of both the employer shall be liable or shall be legally forced forcible to pay only till the limit of 15000 rupees both in the his contribution in the pension scheme as well as the provident fund scheme however the employee can also increase his or her own share right but the same shall not apply to the employer or the establishment right so that limit shall not be there on the establishment now so we have we come to the end of this act employees provident fund and miscellaneous provisions act this is the very act which has created this employment opportunity for all of you because there are supposed to be assistant provident fund commissioners there are supposed to be inspectors under this very act and since the act itself makes it incumbent upon union public service commission to make appointments to any post sub till group b in epfo therefore the pristine the prestigious organization like upsc is conducting entrances for this statutory body even if the exam is separate from the civil services exam it is no less prestigious and coveted these days therefore so at the end we have what we are seeing is the schedule one is the list of industries like we just discussed cement cigarette paper textile sugar rubber tea so all kinds of industries you can read the list right you will find that all kinds of industries are covered under epf and mp act through some or the other head therefore the coverage of the act is very wide and 
if we talk about the future of this organization well since the social security code envisages a universal social security coverage it it wants to cover the gig workers platform workers etc the domestically self employed persons as well therefore the ambit of epfo is going to increase in the times to come therefore this organization epfo which is already one of the biggest social security organizations in the world is going to just expand from here so with this we come to end of today's class in the next class we shall see certain associated provisions of epfo certain new schemes as well as we shall move on to esic act as well thank you